That's okay. Okay. Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. If everyone could please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. Great. I hope everyone's doing well tonight. Uh, we have on tonight's dais, we have missing a couple of members here, Commissioner Kinney and Commissioner Veretti, so we can make a note of the two absences. Um, let's go over our next agenda item, which are our meeting minutes. We are looking for the approval of the Parks and Recreation meeting, meeting minutes from September 13th, 2022. A motion. We'd like to motion to approve. Motion to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. I second it. Thank you, Vice Chair. And our things are working tonight. So we can vote. I don't see anything. You got it. Uh, it marks you as yes, so okay. you're on the screen. Marks me as yes. Okay, I did not vote, but I'll vote yes. I have a thing that just says make a motion on my screen. Okay, we'll leave it at that. All right. Um, at this point in our agenda is our communications from the public. This portion of the agenda is intended for general public comment only on items within the commission's jurisdiction that are listed or not listed on the agenda. Persons wishing to address the Parks and Recreation Commission are requested to identify themselves and state the manner in which they, want to, they wish to comment. No action will be taken on matters not listed on the agenda. Please observe a three minute limit for your communications. And I have some speaker cards from the public. Are there any written comments from the public? No, Chair, no written comments. Okay. So some of you had filled out some speaker cards. So if you want to line up and come down, you may address the commission. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Just state your name and. Hi. Uh, my name is Bobby Vaco. I'm back. Uh, I came back, I came by a couple of uh, sessions ago um, mentioning that I wanted to see a pump track at Corona. And uh, I saw that there was an agenda item for, in the future agenda items uh, listed for this meeting. I prepared a nice slide deck and everything. We emailed it out and things like that, but uh, it wasn't ready to, to share. So uh, I'm still here uh, just to uh, you know, express that I'd love to see a pump track or a bike park in Corona, um, and I'm willing to work with the uh, Parks and Recs Commission and uh, you know whoever and, and Moses and everybody to try and make that happen. Um, I, I understand there might be something in the works, and I want to contribute to that. Um, I have reached out to my council person, uh, Jim Steiner. I'm in District Four, and uh, so far everything has been very positive. So I look forward to it. <laughs> so I just still wanted to put it out there. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Robles, uh, Corona of, uh, uh, resident of Corona, excuse me. Um, so I just wanted to, to show uh, my support for the pump track. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to point out. Um, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to visit another pump track, but I'd like to share some quick insights of things that I've seen. And that's really, um, you know, you think of like skate parks, pump tracks, things like that. A pump track, if you can ride a bike, you can ride it. So uh, if you're in here and you got a bike, like you can go out there and have fun alongside with your kids. And that's something that I really got to experience firsthand. Uh, I got my kids off their devices and they were outside and they don't have a big cycling background. I'm, I'm getting that instilled in them. But the pump track was a huge uh, a tool that I used where they didn't have a large skill set, but they were out there having a blast to the fact that I had to go out and buy more bikes because they were fighting over the fun bike on the pump track. So uh, it, it's been a great experience, myself and the kids using the, t the pump track out to Mayclub, but to have something out here close would be amazing. Also, um, along with uh, Generation MTB, I'm also uh, an affiliate for uh, Bomber Crew MTB, uh, a mountain bike group where uh, a very heavy 
veteran-based, uh, we call it veterans and friends, but our mission is to get, uh, you know, everybody off the couch, um, out of their heads, out of their, their, their thoughts, and not just veterans, but also just e everyday people who, who need that motivation and camaraderie to get out and, you know, lose the smell of the city for a little bit. That's in the mountains, you know, but uh, anyway, I'm just kind of starting to ramble now, but I just really want to show my appreciation for the pump track and, and some of these benefits and, and really, um, that you realize that we're, we're actually hitting a very large demographic. It's not just a very small group of people. It's, it's, it's more than you really think. So I um, just want to share that with you, and that's all I got. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Come on up. Hi, everyone. Austin Riley uh, from Generation MTB, resident of Corona. Um, I support Bobby and Eric's statements. Essentially, my goal with the pump track is having something local that I can take my kids to. Um, the biggest thing for me right now is, like they mentioned, is the nearest pump track for us right now uh, to use as like a skills park or something to have my kids learn on is in Temecula, which is about 45 minutes from us. And then we have the Menifee one opening up. So it would be nice to see something local for us. Um, as Eric mentioned, Generation MTB would be more than help, happy to support and be on board with whatever it takes to, to maintain that portion of that as well. So I just wanted to be here and show my support. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Chris. I've been a resident in Corona for over 20 years. I'm in District 4. I'm also here to show my interest and also explain other people's interest in the pump track. So I believe Temecula, Menifee, Lake Elsinore, and now upcoming is Fullerton. Is They all have pump tracks. And so it'd really be nice if we can get a pump track or a skate park because, I mean, growing up here, it was awesome riding but we'd always have to travel out to other cities like Chino, um, OC, and it's just, it was a bummer being a youth having to try to get access to things that were not accessible. So your parents would have to drive, you know, I really think the city of Corona could benefit from a pump track. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you all for your comments. Okay, I think that covers it on that. All right. And we can move on to our next agenda item, which is our youth update and the report from the Teen Advisory Council. Hello, everyone. Okay. Um, I'm Vesper. I am the president of the Teen Advisory Council. So just some old news just to talk about is we did have our band book week that went on throughout the entirety of September, but specifically the days for band book week were the 18th through the 24th. We had a cart located at the front of the library that had banned books, either banned or challenged books, from across the country. Um, we had those at different reading levels for both children and for adults, and it was an awesome and amazing event, and we had such a fun time putting it together, and thank you guys for all coming out to that. I definitely appreciate that. Now, for some new news coming up, we have Halloween weekend, so very excited. That will be on October 15th. We will be having our own booth, so that is from 5 to 8 here in the lawn, and we are doing a haunted library theme with special guests and story times from your very own library here in Corona. So we look forward to having some fun games, some fun activities. We look forward to this Halloween weekend, and we hope to see you there, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any written comments or speaker cards on this item? No, Chair, no written comments or speaker cards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Olson, do you have any comments or questions? I just want to thank you again for the update. I checked out the banned books. It was very, very cool. And I'm very much looking forward to Halloween weekend this weekend with my kids. Vice Chair Munoz. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, to Bobby, Eric, Austin, and Chris, thank you for tonight. And opening our ears and our eyes to the pump track and skate park in Corona. That's exciting news. Anytime we can get the kids off the couch, anytime we can get the kids off the off their cell phones, you know, and off their out of the bedrooms into the, the streets and, and doing positive things, that's a I think a, it's exciting to hear that. You know, just get outside and breathe in some fresh air and experience the trees and and, and, and really being a family. If you can be a family by doing skate park or a pump track, that's that's positive in my mind. So you have my support. Thank you. And lastly, Esper, I almost forgot. <laughs> looking forward to this weekend. Can't wait. I'm looking forward to volunteering. If you need to volunteer, count me in. 
So hey, high five. Thanks a lot. I think you're going to volunteer for the uh, Corona Parks Foundation because I can't be there. I am. You are. <laughs> I've got your number. <laughs> Thank you, Vesper, for your report. It's great as always. Great work. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our next item, which are, is our director's report. Uh, Dr. Turner, would you like to begin? Sure. Thank you, Chair Wentworth. Commissioners, it's great to be here with you tonight. It feels like a long time. I don't know why it feels so long, but it does feel like it's been a long time since we've gotten together. So good evening, and let's just get right into it. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Um, so first, I want to just talk about the fall workshop. Um, I know that I had spoken to some of you before before the fall workshop just to kind of talk about what community services would be presenting. Um, and we did uh, our own Mo Moses Cortez, our manager of facility parks and trails, um, presented uh, with our assistant to the city manager um, to look at our LMDs and where we are in the LMDs. So this is sort of the second installment of what I call the LMD saga. So we started out um, identifying uh, in the spring um, LMDs that were in financial distress. Um, this presentation to the council on LMDs was talking about ways to address that and options that the council had to address LMDs as we moved forward. Uh, and we will be coming back to the city council um, to talk about how what the next steps are. But this is going to be a, a, a really extensive conversation that's going to last for a while. One of the things I do want to say about the LMDs is this really supports that sense of consistency that we've been talking about with the commission and the council, which is that there's equity. Um, throughout the city, that the city looks consistently like Corona, that you have that sense of look and feel as you look around, you know you're in Corona, in, whether you're on the east side, west side, north side, south side, you know that it's all one city of Corona, uh, and so this is part of that discussion. Um, Mr. Cortez also brought forward our field maintenance standards, and we have discussed that um, multiple times here and we discussed it again with the council and so this was really trying to understand we can do lots of different things with our fields but we need to understand what what is desirous to be the corona standard for field maintenance and so what does that look like and what do we all need to do collectively and together to make that happen so what do we need from the leagues what do we need from us and how do we need to rest those fields and make sure that they are in the best possible um, sustainable uh, condition so that they don't look great for three weeks and then are down to dirt um, on week four uh, and we've put a lot of money um, over the last two years since I've been here um, into those fields and regenerating those fields and within four or five weeks you can't really even tell that we've done anything. So we need to do something different and we need to talk about um, how we want our fields to look. How do you want fields to look when you have folks coming to Corona to watch your children playing soccer or playing baseball or playing softball what is it that we want to say is our standard? What's the minimum standard that we want to have? And, and then we can work back from that on uh, how we will maintain it. And finally, um, Viola Van has been working very hard on the community mural pilot program. Uh, this is a program that the council asked for, which was to start integrating murals into the city of Corona. And she spent a lot of time talking about three parks um, that were an option for them to take a look at of where we might start that first mural project um, and what the structure of that project might be. At the end of the day, the council loved it so much, they wanted us to do all three. We are going to try to tamp down that excitement and do at least just one at a time. Doing all three is a lot. Um, that process will be a lot like our playground pro process. So um, you will have a role in that process. And so we as staff will narrow down the submissions for artwork, then we'll bring it to you. You'll narrow it down further. Council will narrow it down even further, and then we will go out to the community, and the community can vote on that, and we'll do that one at a time. Um, Ms. Van uh, presented three options uh, for three separate parks 
uh, and three separate uh, three separate parks and uh, that we could start with. And so um, the council liked all of those locations. They included Promenade Park, Butterfield Park, and Cresta Verde on the wall by the, the new playground equipment. So um, that's just a recap of what happened in the fall workshop. Uh, we have Committee of the Whole coming up this week. Um, and our folks, our trails master planning folks are gonna come in, Alta planning will come. So I encourage you, even if you can't make it, I know that's a day meeting, to watch that and kind of see where we are on the trails master plan. Huge kudos um, to Mr. Cortez for that, uh, for that work. Uh, the trails working group has been meeting multiple times um, to talk about access, to talk about trails that exist and trails that don't exist. Um, our biggest issue right now that we're working through is how do we create access into the Cleveland National Forest? Um, the first phase of the Trails Master Plan did an amazing job of in, you know, finding, introducing, and identifying circuits within the city and ways to get out and use our open space. Um, and now we really need to be talking about how do we get folks into the Cleveland National Forest from Corona and how do we really package that. The next phase, once we start addressing the access phase, will be wayfinding and signage. Um, and we are also working very closely with our, um, with Chief Michael Negretti uh, and some other folks here in town to talk about land use, uh, as well as the history of who has owned the land and how do we want to talk about the land as people are coming out and hiking as we're doing um, ranger-led hikes and those kinds of things. How are we going to talk about this land and how are we going to share the history of this land both in signage uh, and in script as we talk to folks? And then the ever-exciting Women's Victory Service Flag Conservation and Display. We've been working on this one a long time. This is an item that was in um, the City of Corona Heritage Room in the library. Um, that's a flag that was there to honor um, Corona veterans from World War II, uh, and it flew and was uh, sewn by women in Corona to um, mark both those veterans who returned and those who did not with this women's victory flag. And so the council has been very interested in the community being exposed to that flag. So we're going to be giving them some options both about conservation for that flag, how do we restore it, uh, conserve it, uh, and then how do we display it. So that will be on the committee of the whole. Griffin Park renovation phase two. I got to tell you, I am, oops, I'm just so excited. I went right past it. So um, this is amazing. We, um, you know, I think everybody wants to be on a winning team. And right now in Corona, Parks and Recreation is a winning team. And so amazingly, the state found $2 million to help us finish phase two of Griffin Park. This was on our agenda when we talked to state and federal legislators and um, Sabrina Cervantes, assembly member Sabrina Cervantes, um, found $2 million and was able to advocate for that and that came through in the state budget. So there will be a check presentation on this Thursday um, from nine to 10 a.m. at Griffin Park. And it's really exciting. I think, please come out, enjoy it, see the check presentation. We are making strides in our park. I wanna thank this commission for what you've done at Auburndale and what you've authorized to have done at Auburndale and what you advocated with this council to have done at Auburndale. We're starting that project. We're starting the CB CDBG projects uh, in both Sheridan and Victoria parks. We are making progress. And what I wanna remind you is as enmeshed as we are in this parks and recreation master planning process and how exciting all of that is, we are also working on renovating, rejuvenating, opening, and creating more access in our parks all during that process. So no one has to hold their breath until September of 2023 when we deliver that plan. You're gonna be seeing lots of stuff happening in our parks in the interim. So we're very excited, we're very excited about that. Um, I do wanna say that the project for the phase two of Griffin Park is currently under design with our designers. And the amenities will include my most favorite, a restroom, which is super exciting because that always makes a visit to the park much nicer when you, when you have a nice, safe place to use the restroom. We'll have a climbing structure. We'll have passive use trails, which again, will contribute to our uh, 
in, uh, to our municipal trail system. We'll have seating with a pergola. We'll have some shelters. In addition, we're going to have some flexible space that can be programmed either for contract classes like yoga or mommy and me. We're really wanting to engage, activate this park. This park, as you will remember, when I got here a couple of years ago, um, we, we really hadn't made the kind of strides that we wanted to there. And we had a lot of unsheltered folks who were residing there. And we had a lot of stuff that was going on there. And it's just been amazing to see this gradual transformation of the park over these last two years. And we're very excited um, to bring that forward. So we're hoping to have the initial design done by early 2023 and get to work. Uh, so we have a project. It's a, it's a school district project. It's a joint use ramp. Um, and so we've been working, uh, or Mr. Cortez has been working um, with CUNSD and El Cerrito Middle School. Um, we've had several productive meetings and we think that this is really positive. This is one of the times when our team can meet with the school district team and really come together to solve an issue, right? So we had a lot of kids. They actually had done some shifting around in the school district and so El Cerrito School now has more students than, than it had had before. Um, but at dismissal time, those kids just kind of like flood out into the, into the street and there's weird, you know, as a parent, you're trying to get that kid picked up and get on to the next thing. And so there was a lot of things that we were feeling like, wow, we should really create a thoughtful and intentional pathway for these students. Um, and this ramp um, married with our park can do that. So the school district's gonna work on their side, which is creating the ramp, and we are gonna support that in our park by um, creating the gate and creating a safe pathway so students have an intentional pathway to get picked up by parents and, and have safe, uh, a safe way to exit school. So we're very excited about that project, and I think both entities are eager to move ahead rapidly. Okay, it's Halloween. It's so exciting. I had somebody ask me, you know, why do we do Halloween on October 15th? I said, because we kick off the Halloween season in the whole Inland Empire. What are you kidding me? This is, we are the first. So come on out and join us. We've got our treat trail. I, Mr. Lass and the recreation group have done a fantastic job. Um, their special events are bar none. I would put it up against any Halloween celebration anywhere. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we'll have a family outdoor movie. We'll have an escape room. So there's something for everyone from the little itty bitties all the way up to grown adults. It's going to be an exciting time. The movie on the lawn, I know you've all been waiting, Hotel Transylvania. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it is, it is, it is a real, it's a good one. I like it. Um, but we have, we have food booths. We're going to have photo ops. And one of the things I, I know that each of you have gotten a request from us to come, if you can, for, for about 10 minutes during Halloween weekend. Why, you say? Because we are doing an amazing Parks and Recreation Master Plan, and we are going to have an opportunity for you to be able to do some outreach with the public during Halloween. weekend. Halloween weekend is one of those events that's a signature event for the city. It's something we're very well known for. People come from all over, and this is just a fantastic time to engage with the public and ask them how they're feeling about our parks. So this is a great time to do that. Um, and so... Uh, uh, Caroline Bustos, our park planner, has worked really hard on doing some really fun opportunities. And I will just say, if you come in, fill out the survey, and engage with us, there may be an exciting little thing that you may be able to take away with you, little gifts, treats, and treats. No tricks, all treats. Uh, so really encouraging folks to come out and let us know what they think about our parks, let us know what they want to see. This is a community-driven parks and recreation master plan, and we want to make sure that it's really reflective of the community. Senior center travel program. Like, I feel like everything is blossoming, like flowers are blossoming right now. So we are so excited uh, in the recreation department to have our senior travel program back. They did their first trip up to Lake Arrowhead. They've got Julian for the day and Carlsbad and the Getty, which is always a terrific day. So all of those things are coming up. 
Um, we've had great response. They are selling out, and folks are really enjoying not only the camaraderie of being around one another, but being able to go to places that they really haven't been able to go for the last couple of years. And so folks, many folks who didn't really travel outside of the city are being able to a very, for a very reasonable price to safely travel in one of our buses and have a wonderful day uh, out and away from Corona. So that's the only time we ever want you to leave Corona is if you're going on a senior excursion. So um, the, this program is made possible with the generous support of the Riverside County Board of Supervisors whose funding helps us offset the, co the costs of the bus. Um, and trips are open to adults 50 and older I don't know if any of you qualify, hmm. but, uh, but early reservations are encouraged because the space is limited. So uh, please check that out and we're getting lots of great feedback about those trips. Corona beautiful, so I need all of you to scan in the picture and try to find yourself in this picture. So each and every one of you has, uh, has participated in our Corona beautiful events and I really wanna thank you so much for that. I wanna remind you that that opportunity is always available to you and we will be working on East Upper Drive and Lemon Grove Lane. Uh, we'll be planting some trees and doing some cleanup. So please come out and join us for that. Uh, it's on Saturday, September 20, now one says September 24th and one says, I, oh, this says September 24th because that's gone, that's where the picture's from. See, if I could read my actual script, I wouldn't make such mistakes up here. So we had an amazing event on September 24th and we will have a terrific event on Saturday, October 22nd. So there you go. Um, we had over 60 volunteers on the 24th um, doing the cleanup on Skyline Trail and litter abatement, graffiti removal, and it was 120 hours of service to Corona's public spaces. And a huge thank you um, to our volunteer coordinator, Madeline Black, uh, who makes that happen. And in her interim, she's, having a she's had a beautiful baby boy. Um, and so until she returns to us, we will all pitch in and make sure all of those events go off smoothly in her absence. Um, at the library, I wanna share with you that we're doing Star Wars Reads. That's uh, the whole month of October. It's open to, um, all ages, it's a reading challenge, um, and you read five books and win a prize. Activity kits are also available while supplies last, and this is a fun time if you're just feeling the costuming spirit of, of October, just come on into the library dressed in a Star Wars costume, read a book, have a great time. There's always opportunities for play, and play is very important in our very stressful lives. So enjoy Star Wars reads. Um, this is a big one for the community. I have to say I was at the library yesterday and I couldn't find a parking space. So this is exciting. We're getting back to this, you know, folks coming in, really utilizing our services, really utilizing the library, really getting out there and doing stuff. So that's really exciting. On that same note, we have special story times. This is a combined preschool and itty bitty story times. It's gonna be from uh, 10.15 to 10.45 in the fam room. And you can wear costumes to this one too. This is super exciting. So we have Star Wars reads on, uh, or we had Star Wars reads, a story time on October 6th. And we will have our Hall Halloween story time on October 27th. So Parks and Recreation Master Plan. So I'm super excited about what we're doing because you remember when I came on board, I told you I was gonna do all kinds of crazy things. Well, here we go. These are some of the fun, crazy things we're gonna do. Look for the leaf. Everywhere you go, Corona, look for the leaf. So in every one of our parks, you will have leaves up in the park. They will have this QR code, this QR code will um, take you to the Parks and Recreation Master Plan survey. But these signs will stay up in our parks ongoing. We will transition the back end of these signs to be um, to tell us what you think of our park. So whether you're a Corona resident or somebody who's come from out of town, um, come, we'll have a few questions on there to tell us about your park experience. Wow, I had a great park experience. Wow, the trash cans were clean. The restrooms were amazing. It was the best thing ever. Um, that's your default, by the way, for the survey. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but these leaves will be all around the park so that you can go ahead 
and scan them uh, and tell us what you think. But most of all, we really want you to participate in the Parks and Recreation uh, Master Plan surveying process. So for our park ambassadors and for all of you when you're in the park, please just, you can get your phone, encourage others to get your phone, show people what you're doing. You know, sometimes it's just by leading by example. People will walk by a QR code, but when they actually see somebody using it, you can say, hey, come on over. Let me show you this QR code. So we'd love for you to get as many folks as involved as possible. So uh, you will see leaves falling in a park near you. Just a little. Had to add that one in. Uh, please stop by the Parks and Recreation Master Plan booth, as I said, at Halloween weekends. Um, and we will be doing a marketing launch. We're going to be doing a campaign around the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. So look in your mailbox for postcards um, directing you to the survey. And know that our Parks and Recreation Plan is rooted in the community. So please keep an eye out for our new campaign. And always, you can always check our website both on Trails Master Plan, Parks and Recreation Master Plan, City Park Master Plan, just to see where we are in all of those processes. So it's time to meet with 110%. So please make sure you have on your schedule that Wednesday, October 26, from 9 a.m. to 10.30, we will be meeting again with our consultants, 110%. That's Jamie Savage and uh, Farrell Bueller. And I didn't say that right. I, I'm thinking of... I, I'm thinking of Ferris Bueller, thank you. No, I won't, I won't say Farrell's last name because I'm going to mess it up, but it does start with a B, and anyway, it all goes astray. But you will be meeting with them from 9 to 10.30. We'll be talking to you some more about how the financial back end of this Parks and Recreation Master Plan is going to be integrated into the plan. So please mark your calendars. You guys did an amazing job the last time we met with the consultant, and I got incredible feedback from the consultant about how productive um, that session was. So I look forward to having another really good session together. And surprisingly, for the longest director's report ever, we are at the end. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. OK, thank you. Are there any speaker cards or written correspondence for this agenda item? No, Chair, no speaker cards are written comments. Okay, then we can move on to Commissioner questions and comments. Commissioner Olson, do you have anything? I do. Um, yeah, what have you guys been doing? Anything? I mean, <laughs> nothing going on at all. Uh, so much, uh, so much exciting stuff. Um, the Griffin Park renovation phase two, I'm going to try to be there. That's awesome. The joint use ramp update, I love to see that collaboration between different entities in our community. Um, as a parent of a now high schooler, former middle schooler, I know these pickups are. They're, they're chaos. Um, they happen to be the Citrus Hills for myself. Um, and I know the park there is very commonly used as, as a safe pickup place there. So I appreciate all of those efforts. Can't wait for Halloween weekend. Senior travel program, awesome. That's cool. I assume people sign up on the website for that. Um, went out to, to Hatchby Park over the weekend with my kids, saw the QR code, used the QR code. I was thrilled to see it, the park. And, and you know what? The bathrooms were super clean. Uh, and I, I was thrilled. I was a thrilled user uh, to go out there. I uh, did have a couple of questions um, on the workshop. Um, LMD update. And, and I should have asked this last time, but how does an LMD become distressed? And how do we kind of predict that? Because, you know, an LMD can kind of chug along for years and years and years, and all of a sudden, we're in trouble. So uh, Moses can answer this much more technically than I can. What I will say generally is, is that LMDs and CFDs were done at different periods of time, and we knew more about how they functioned. You know, the newer ones are in great shape, mm. right? And we built into those newer ones escalators. So we thought about the fact, you know, there's going to be inflation. You know that the $50 you pay today in 10 years isn't going to have the same value as, as that $50 will maybe be $20. And so the ones that are in really good shape are the ones that were newer when we knew more and, and knew better. And so um, they have escalators in them. Um, it's also that some of them are just enormous. I mean, they're just big, huge zones with a lot of people and a lot to cover. Um, and the cost of doing business has risen exponentially. 
So, and will continue to rise. So not only is that the human cost for our contractors for them paying higher minimum wage and workers comp and all of that, but it's coming down from the state of California that gasoline powered tools are no longer going to be able to be used because of air quality. And so you're gonna to have to move to electric. So for big, huge contracting companies that do landscaping, that means phasing out their entire toolkit, including tractors and chainsaws and all of that, and moving to electric battery, you know, or battery operated machinery. And that obviously comes with a great cost. For those LMDs that have escalators in them that first of all were assessed properly and they had a fair assessment to start with, and then they have escalators in them, that gives us an ability to respond to that so that as they're changing out and their expenses are growing, our income is growing. For those that don't have escalators, our expenses keep growing and they keep paying the same amount of money. And, um, and unfortunately, what it has done is it has made the community um, look really different in different parts. So I often tell the story that I came to Corona for the first time, and I was driving around and didn't know I was still in Corona. So I, I felt like two very different cities, just the way the landscaping was, what what the plant materials were and all of that. And so I think we're trying to do two things simultaneously. One, make them financially healthy. And two, really create a plant palette and a very intentional thought about something that ties the whole city together that feels very holistic. So it may not look exactly the same, but you'll recognize a plant or you'll recognize a palette and you'll say, oh, of course this goes with that. Uh, that's 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 what we're trying to do. Awesome. That that's actually very helpful. I appreciate that. On the field maintenance standards, you know, we talked about it at the last meeting, and then you know the night before the meeting happened, Councilman Steiner reached out and said, "So which option do you support?" Right? And what options? Um, so in in that setting, it would be very helpful if if the council is going to be presented options because they do look to us for an advisory role in this sort of things to understand what those options are, so that we can kind of weigh in on that and help them, you know, inform them of, of what we've discussed too. So going forward in, in situations like that would be helpful. So kind of a request on that one. Um, and on the Trails Master Plan update, Generation MTBs here, awesome, great. I hope you guys are vested in that process because you know you you would be a stakeholder in that process. So if you guys can be here tomorrow too, that might be uh, something helpful for for us as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Munoz. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as I listened here to the report, I was uh, happy to hear all the positive news. It's all music to my ears from the trails master plan to the updates on the LMD and the questions put forth by Mr. Uh, Chairman Olson. It's all exciting news, and so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to say it's great to see all the activity. I'll just, you know, third that. But uh, I just want to reiterate that the Halloween weekend was such a success the first two times we did it that I think the third time is gonna be off the charts. And I'm really sad that I'm not gonna be there. But it is an amazing weekend. I've put it all over social media and I've seen people commenting. So I think we're gonna have a great response. I think it's gonna be really big with families. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing how that goes and sorry to miss it. The um, trail cleanup with the graffiti, I just want to say we did a lot of graffiti cleanup out there, and thank you to the volunteers I, as well. I, I came out of the canyon just stained. I had paint all over the front of me, all over my sleeves. I don't know what happened, but I just, all the graffiti got off the rocks and like onto my outfit when I was trying to clean these rocks, so I don't know. However, it, it makes me so aggravated to go hiking back there in these skyline trails and see graffiti everywhere that I'm just so happy that we have residents and volunteers that just 
roll up their sleeves and get out there and just really will clean it up with us. Um, the hikers, the trash out there comes and goes. The hikers that are out there will bring bags. Myself, I'll bring a bag and I'll pick up trash as I go. And that will come and go, but that graffiti it just builds up and builds up. So thank you, um, Mr. Cortez, for giving us the supplies and so that we could do that. So I think that was great. Um, the travel program for the seniors, um, this is great to see this come back. I know that we are ramping up. There's more activity now that COVID is slowing down. Everybody's getting that next booster shot. So it's great to see this. This was, um, the travel program is so important to our seniors and it's something that with funding got less and less over the years that I've been on, on the commission. Um, and then with COVID, it went away altogether. So it's fantastic to see it come back. And I'm, I'm hoping that the seniors will really take advantage of this and you will end up going back to the county and saying, we need even more money. We need another bus. So <laughs> that would be great. Um, my final question is um, actually on the field maintenance standards. I had the same issue as Commissioner Olson. I was approached, didn't know the options, didn't know what to say. I said I would go with the staff recommendation only because of what we sat through with 110%. Um, I, am, I would like more information on that, having been um, very involved with my kids. And you laid it out exactly. The staff would work very hard. All this money would go into these fields and it wouldn't even really last two weeks and it would be back to dust. Um, so I, I really am interested to see exactly what would go into making these fields more useful for longer for our players, basically. So I'd like more information on that as we go forward and make sure that we're up to date. Um, I think the commission probably gets most, I think the leagues will reach out to us and, and contact us as, as far as letting us know how things are going or not going well. So it would be great if we have that knowledge and we know where we're going with this program and where it needs to be in the compromises as we talked about. Like, so as we as commissioners understand where the leagues are gonna come in and where we're gonna come in. So that would be helpful. So I really appreciate that. I'm glad we're moving forward with this. It's a huge item and it's a huge undertaking by you guys. So I'm excited because it's been something since I've been up here that's been a real issue. And it's, it's just wonderful to see it starting to move forward into, um, I don't wanna say solution. I wanna say a resolution of, we come to an understanding of where we're gonna be. And this is a standard of where we're gonna be and not at the, so much at the expense of other things that we have, you know, like fields you can play golf on, but then we don't have anything else in the city. So I, I totally get that there is a trade-off here. So um, with that, I think, I don't think I had any more questions. Um, oh, on the, I really love the QR codes. When I came in, I was asking uh, Dr. Turner, if she had the QR codes for the survey, so I'm super excited to see those at the parks. Um, I wanna take one with me. I was just curious as to how you, how many you were gonna put per park and how, how populated in the park are you gonna put these leaves? So right now we had five leaves made per park. We're gonna see how that works. We're putting them in the highest. We have asked our, um, our, our guys who work in the parks to show, kind of tell us where sort of the highest sort of congregating spaces are. So we've definitely put them near playground equipment. We've put them near the restroom. Mm -hmm. And then by park, we've put other, other leaves up based upon kind of what it is. At minimum, you should see two leaves per park. Um, we do, we're, we're kind of holding back and seeing how that plays. If we need to put some more leaves in, we can do that. Um, uh, the, uh, Ms. Bustos and the, the park planning team worked really hard on getting the leaves designed and so we can create more leaves if we think that there needs to be more leaves. We want this to be an attraction and not sign pollution. So we're trying to find that, that right balance where it's enough that people will use them, but not so much that they're like, oh my gosh, there's just leaves everywhere. This is too much for me to deal with. Um, so, uh, so start looking out. You should see them. You should see them already in your in your parks. And then on the field maintenance piece, I just wanted to let both of you know that I apologize. That is completely on me. Our timing had been off 
Um, I September was a, a rough month. I was in and out of the office. Um, we would normally have brought the field maintenance to you beforehand. The timing didn't work with the fall workshop to do that. So I knew we, we, we let you know we were bringing it, but the presentation wasn't ready to present to the commission before we went to, uh, to the council. In future, all of those kinds of items will come to you first, um, or at least we can talk through them big picture so you can know what kind of options are coming in front of the council and what staff recommends. I think we had a good understanding of where you were going, which is why I was comfortable with saying, you know, what I what I said to my council member. So I we at least had that, and I like I said with the 110 percent, I kind of I get where we're kind of go with this, and there is going to be some compromise. There's going to be happy and unhappy on both sides, but we'll we'll get to a middle middle ground. So I, I understand that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I think that covers it. For my end, so I don't think I, I don't have any more questions on that item. Do you guys have anything else you need to ask? Nothing? Okay. All right, we can move on to our next agenda item, which is Community Services Budget and Park Bond Quimby Loan Overview. And that report is going to be brought to us by our Finance Director, Ms. Sitton. Good evening, Chair Wentworth and, and Commissioners. Uh, thank you for a chance to share this information with you tonight. Um, I'm going to be providing you with just an overview of the community services budget and the park bond and the Quimby loan. The presentation tonight is broken down into four different sections. Uh, please feel free to stop me at any point along the way if you have a question or something's not clear. Happy to discuss it when we're at that particular section. <clears throat> so the first thing we're going to talk about is fund accounting and fund types. I won't get too technical down the accounting uh, trail there, but just kind of want to tell you for, in government, um, we use what we call fund accounting. And that separates our resources um, into different buckets, if you will, to ensure we're complying with legal requirements. Um, that's, for instance, if we get money for gas tax that has to be used for road repairs or for staff that's working on road repairs, we can't use that money to, say, go... Um, put grass in at a park, you know, so we have to separate these different monies to make sure that we're spending it on the, the right thing that we receive the money for. Um, each fund is a separate accounting entity and does have assets, liabilities, fund equity, revenue, and expenses. And then, like I said, we divide them up into various types based on legal restrictions that are opposed upon them. So there's three main categories, um, governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary. And within each of those categories, there's subcategories. So under governmental um, is the general fund, and then there's special revenue funds. And those special revenue funds are designated for specific purposes. Those two items are highlighted yellow because those are the funds that if you saw this presentation I gave about a year and a half ago, those were the two funding sources that community services had at that time existing in their budget. But as you know, we went through a reorganization in this last fiscal year, so community services gained the funds that are highlighted in blue. So you can see under governmental, they gained capital project funds, which are CDBG and home funds. <clears throat> and then also under proprietary, they gained enterprise funds, which are the transit services and the airport fund. So when I say they gained fund, they also gained a lot of functions that went along with those dollars. So. <laughs> So just to give you an idea of what some of the different revenue examples are under these different fund types. So under governmental, we have things like property and sales tax, all of our building fees, all of our recreation revenues are collected here, developer impact fees, uh, trash and recycling, state and federal grants, and then CFDs and LMD revenues. Those all come in under this bucket called governmental. Under proprietary is where we have utility fees, bus fares, airport tie downs, state and federal governments, and internal service revenues. And under fiduciary, these are more custodial in nature, where we're kind of the, the custodian for these monies, and they're not really belonging to us, but we have to hold on to them and spend them in a certain way based on um, the agreements and how they're designated when they come to us. And then, I know that some of the examples here aren't necessarily applying to the community services department, but just wanted to give you a bigger understanding of what these different fund types mean and, and what kind of revenue is generated in those areas. Any questions on that before we move on to the operating and capital budgets? So for community services, the operating budget is kind of four main buckets. We have community assistance is where our CDBG and home investment program activity occurs, also the Corona Housing Authority and transportation services. 
under facilities, trails, parks and trails, that's where we have facility maintenance. All of the maintenance of the parks, trees, medians, um, building maintenance is under this area as well, and this is where facility projects would be housed also. Of course, under library or library services, programming and outreach, and then recreation, of course, has uh, the administration of the whole department as well as events and programs. So this is a snapshot of what the operating budget looks like for community services. Uh, the two graphs are the exact same information, it's just different ways of slicing and dicing the information. So on the left-hand side, you can see the adopted budget by expenditure category. And in community services, the largest portion is the uh, contractual portion. And this is all of those LMDs and CFDs and the maintenance of those. So you have your mowing and landscape contracts, um, <clears throat> contracts for bus services, the transit, that also falls into this group. And also any other professional contract services would fall into this category. Under materials and supplies, you have about 25.9%, and that would include construction materials, um, tree maintenance, program expenditures, books, uh, graffiti removal, and then motor pool charges, which is like the fuel and um, maintenance and upkeep of the, the vehicles that are operated by the department. Uh, personnel services, of course, that's about 33.1%. That's all salaries and benefits for both full-time and part-time. Utilities would include all of our water utility, CNG fuel for the transportation services, as well as electric. And then capital outlay is a pretty small um, piece of the pie, and that includes some machinery and equipment that was um, budgeted for the department. And on the right-hand side, you can see the different funding sources that make up that $26.6 million budget. So the general fund is the largest portion um, at 63.9%, about $17 million. And the rest of that is broken up with um, the next one is the CFT and LMD funds at about $5.5 million, enterprise funds at about $3.6 million, and then the capital project funds, which like I said are CDBG and home, and the developer impact funds make up a very small amount here because most developer impact funds are used for capital projects. Uh, there is a total of 115.33 uh, FTEs budgeted in the department for fiscal year 23. And as you are fully aware is that, you know, personnel services, um, <clears throat> when we start to make trade-offs and, you know, contract out certain things, your personnel dollars may go down, but then your materials, supplies, and your contractual numbers are going to go up as well as, you know, we do, there's a trade-off there when you don't have the in-house uh, staff that's performing certain functions. So taking a look at the capital projects that are under the, the guise of community services, um, currently, they have $22.3 million in projects that they're managing. Uh, just to give you some examples are the citywide ADA improvements, the Intelligent Transportation System, Auburndale's, Auburndale Amenities Project, Facilities, Parks and Amenities, uh, Parks Amenities Replacement, the demo of the Armory Building, and of course the multiple master plans for Trails, City Park, and the Parks Master Plan. The general fund does make up 42.4% of the total projects. And the, when we talk about general fund, it's, um, it also includes Measure X money. That, that's kind of under the umbrella of the general fund. Now taking a closer look at Measure X, which I'm sure you were aware is the additional 1% sales tax that was approved uh, by voters and effective um, in fiscal year 22. So we've now, we're now going into our second year of receiving Measure X funding. And overall, cumulatively, um, about 21.7% of Measure X funding is being allocated to uh, parks and recreation activities, um, including some money that's being put aside into a reserve, cumulatively about $8.9 million. And just to give you some examples of, of what's being funded through Measure X for community services is the demo of the Armory Building, Parks Amenities Replacement, Heritage Room Expansion, Auburndale Amenities, Border Pickleball Lights, the restoration of the city's urban forest, <clears throat> some funding for graffiti removal, uh, and then also some positions, the Facilities Parks and Trails Manager, the Park Ranger Program, Parks Planner, Trails Planner, and five Program Coordinator positions. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just to give you some examples of, of what's included. Any questions on the Measure X before we move on to the next section? I do have a question. Sure. So um, Parks and Recreation is obviously a pretty big slice of that pie. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we would expect to continue into the future? Or is that kind of reevaluated annually? It is reevaluated re 
can't say that word, sorry. <laughs> Annually, we do take a look at that. Um, but it is one of the high priorities that when we went out and did a survey about um, the community's priorities for this Measure X, that was definitely high on the list. So you'll see public safety and parks and recreation are the, the top two that are coming in there. I do anticipate that to continue in the future. So now taking a look at the monthly fund balance and loan reports that are provided to the commission. So on a monthly basis, you'll find attached to your packet is um, a monthly report on the park bond loan repayment <clears throat> and the fund balances of the developer impact funds. Uh, we only showed three of the funds. They're the ones that you would be interested in or they have projects that are funding community services activity. So the park bond loan repayment is the estimated year-end loan balance um, based on incoming monthly revenues. We're gonna go into that particular item in more detail in the very next section. Um, in the developer impact fee reports, um, these are the monthly reports that give you the beginning fund balance and they take a look at the, the fiscal year, what we think we're gonna receive in revenue, what we're gonna spend, and then where we think we'll be at the end of the fiscal year. And these developer impact fees are money that come in from development activity and they need to be spent on capital improvements um, for these different areas, the meet public meeting facilities, aquatic center, and parks and open space. So the park bond loan repayment funds, uh, there was an administrative policy um, called the Parks and Recreation Commission Recommendations for Use of General Fund Park Fees, AKA Park Maintenance and Improvement Account, and that this was approved by the City Council in May of 2020. So what happens is throughout the, the budget process, uh, staff is to develop a list of projects that are consistent with the Parks and Recreation Facilities Condition and Needs Assessment that was completed in 2020. <clears throat> and then the commission is to uh, receive that proposed list during the budget process, review it prior to it coming to city council for adoption of the annual budget. So you have some input there on, on the, um, some of the general fund monies that are coming from that park bond loan repayment. Again, in the next section, we're gonna go through that, that in a little more detail. Um, and then of course, any other recommendations to city council on, on the budget issues, um, that would just be working with staff and the director to get those on a, an agenda and recommend those items to the city council. So Quimby fees and the park open space. Um, these are fees that come to the city through development. Quimby fees are related to development and they're applied to single family detached homes at the time the map is recorded, only if a subdivision of the land is involved. For instance, a new track of homes, you have a very large parcel that's then subdivided into parcels to build actual homes and that's when the Quimby fees come into play. All other types of development fall under the parks and open space. So development related fees like for multifamily homes, apartments, townhomes, condos, mobile homes, things like that, senior living facilities, or like a single parcel where a um, custom home is gonna be built, it's already been subdivided, right? So, that, so it would fall under this parks and open space category. And these are the two different fees that then come to us um, related to the park development. So back in 1989, there were park bonds that were issued to develop uh, a number of parks. Um, the bonds were issued for $27.4 million. And at that time, <clears throat> 98 acres of parkland was acquired and improved. Uh, you can see the list of different parks here in their acreage. And at that time, the estimate was that the Quimby funds coming in were going to cover all the debt service payments on those park bonds. And at some point, the fees being collected under Quimby, um, remember that's again the single detached family homes that get subdivided, um, the fees coming in under that category were not sufficient anymore to cover those debt service payments. So in fiscal year 92-93, the general fund began subsidizing those debt service payments and then it was recorded as an inner fund loan. In 2017, uh, the city council then approved a resolution that said that 76% 6, of the parks and open space diff fees could then be used to pay down that park loan in addition to the Quimby fees. And then in September of 2019, uh, the council was, there was a lot of discussion and the council was presented with different options regarding that park bond loan. And so the two options at that time were either to discharge the loan completely or to designate the, the repayment from the diff fees uh, to be set aside in a maintenance and improvement account. 
Um, so essentially the money moving from the parks and open space, moved to the general fund to pay down the loan, and then got set aside to be used for park improvement projects. And that was the option that the council approved back in 2019. And then just to give you a frame of reference, it's at, um, in fiscal year 2016, the loan balance for these park bonds was about $14.8 million. And the loan balance at the end of fiscal year 22 is now 7.8. So this is just to give you a visual picture of how this works. So um, to show you the buckets and how the money is moving. On the far left side, you can see <clears throat> the Quimby fees and the parks and open, excuse me, the parks and open space diff fees. The revenue is coming into those two different buckets throughout the fiscal year. At the end of the fiscal year, the money that was received in Quimby is used and transferred to the general fund and it pays down a, a portion of the loan. That's at 100%. The parks and open space diff fees that are received, and again, this is from the multifamily, townhomes, apartments, things like that, 76.34% of that money is moved over to the general fund to pay down the loan but then that money gets siphoned off and is set aside in a parks maintenance and improvement account. That gets then reserved in the fund balance in the general fund, and that's the money that, going back to that administrative policy a couple slides ago, where when those projects are presented to the commission for review and approval, this is some of the money that, that um, can be dipped into or can be used for those, those types of projects. Um, this year, for the in fiscal year 22, for the first time in three years, there was actually some money that did come in from Quimby, about $686,000. So that helped to bring down uh, the, the balance on the park bond loan. <clears throat> um, that Quimby money, it's just it's been a little all over the map in terms of uh, how it's not consistent. So um, to the fact that we got close to $700,000 this last fiscal year was, was really good news to help bring that down. Um, let me see, that's all I have on that particular item. I know it's a bit confusing. I'm happy to answer any questions for you if you'd like. Um, I'm happy, yeah, happy to take any questions. Okay, do you have any questions, Commissioner Olson? I, I do. Um, you've done a fantastic job of taking something incredibly complex and distilling it down to, someone, uh, to something that someone like me can, can get. So um, we're still paying off a commitment that we made in 1989. Is, is that kind of the bottom line? Right. And we have about seven million bucks left on that commitment. Correct. Wild. Okay. Thank you. Vice Chair Munoz, do you have any questions? Uh, once again, I just want to reiterate what uh, Commissioner Olson basically said. That uh, great presentation. Yeah. Also, we are going. We're paying the debts off as best as we can, as quick as we can. So that's positive. So we're getting there. Takes time. We got a track record of doing positive things to get in the right direction. So this takes time. Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to say thank you. Um, the commissioners may not know, I've sat through many iterations of this report, trying to make this digestible for the commission. It's, it's kind of hard to understand. At some points I've been up here trying to explain this myself um, way back when. Um, so I, I do understand it. We, um, we are, we are benefiting from a change in ordinance where we are taking the money that is supposedly owed, but we spend it ourselves. We owe ourselves money. It's, they could have discharged the loan altogether, and we'd still be taking, even if they had discharged the loans, these fees that we're collecting would go back to parks. So it's, it's great to see that we're not in the position where we were in 2017 when they decided to take the fees. They could go into the general fund and then be spent on anything. They didn't have to go to parks. So that the change really is that 2020, you know, forcing those dollars to go back into the community for parks. And that's why we're seeing some of these improvements. And um, as the community writes us and they ask for um, items in the parks to uh, be changed out, maintained and so forth, you know, this is part of that explanation as to how we got where we are with the maintenance backlog and how we are now moving forward. So I'm just glad that you guys understand it and it was a great presentation, so thank you. I don't, I don't particularly have any questions at this time. Thank you, I did, I did want to add one more thing, is that you know, I do think one of the benefits of being set up in this way is that when fund, 217 is very, very specific and strict about what it can be used for. By being it structured this way, when it pays down the loan to the general fund, once it's in the general fund and designated for, for use, 
It can be used for maintenance projects. It has, it, it has a wider range of things that can be used for. So that is one of the positive things of having it as part of the general fund and designated as such for your use once it's there. Right, right. So what she's saying is like, in essence, to me, it, if you had the fund 217 directly coming, then the state is basically saying you can only spend it on these particular things. Mm -hmm. The fact that it goes in the general fund allows us more flexibility of what we can spend it on. So rather than spending it on something new, we can spend it on something to fix, which is different. So earmarked dollars in the general fund. Right. For and it's not to be spent on park maintenance. Mm -hmm. So you would see this money coming in and be like, why can't we fix something? And you'd look at the fund and Ms. Sint would say, well, because you're not allowed to spend it on fixing things. With it going into the general fund, we can spend it on fixing things, and that's part of our explanation to the community on how we are moving forward with some of these maintenance projects and things that had been neglected since the 2008-2009 economic downturn, basically. That's where we're at. So it, if I'm wrong, you can correct me, but that's kind of how I understand it. No, that, that's correct. Okay, thanks. One more question. Um, interest, any, any risk of interest outpacing our ability to repay? Is it set up like that? There's, there's no interest on, on it. it. It was a no interest loan. Okay. Well, we owe it to the general fund, so right. why would they Understood. charge yeah. interest? Yeah. yeah. Right. So is there any, um, if, when the area of Green River gets developed, that, that will be, what's the next influx that you're looking at for development fees coming in? So that's the thing at the moment. Um, I don't have anything on the horizon. Most of the bigger projects have, have been taken care of in terms of subdividing in, like, for those Quimby fees. Um, we can definitely get together with our planning and development department and see if they have anything that they're looking at in the future. Um, but, but I do see that particular revenue source as, as dwindling. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions? You, you all right? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that report. Um, were there any public comments or written comments that came in? No, Chair. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, our next item on our agenda is the consent calendar. And that is what we just talked about. That is our park bond loan repayment information that's in our packets. So can I have um, uh, someone move for the August 22nd? I move. Okay. And I will second. Okay. And then we can vote. Let's see if my screen works. There we go. Okay, and that motion passes, so that report is received and filed. Our next item agenda is commission members' reports and comments. Would you like to kick it off, Commissioner Olson? Uh, yeah, I'll keep it real brief. I just wanted to thank the residents uh, who came out to speak on behalf of the pump track, and it's been a popular topic in the community. Um, I would definitely welcome more discussion in this commission on, um, you know, possibilities where we might put something like that, how it might fit into the bigger plan that we're working on. Uh, obviously, it's got to slot into the bigger plan that we're working on. Uh, but thank you very much for coming out. I look forward to, you know, uh, your more formal presentation. I, I may have caught a glimpse of it uh, elsewhere, and it looks good. So I, I look forward to that. You come back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Vice Chair Munoz, do you have anything? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, I've been able to speak to the council people between last month and this month and commissioners at various locations, football games but mostly. But uh, I want to say that the uh, people that we just, I just mentioned are really loyal to the soil. And they really love the community. They really love the people. They love the residents. And they wholeheartedly believe that we make a difference as a team, as a family. So again, we're very loyal to the soil. And then uh, last month, I had an opportunity to go to the, uh, the uh, His Hispanic Heritage panel, and it was just full of esperanza and hope, you know. So I'm hoping, too, that uh, people that were here, people that I saw on TV, uh, can uh, s discuss that with people who weren't here, who may not have heard anything about that particular panel. But I was moved by that. You know, uh, you had generation gaps between person A and person D, and it's amazing how it went, and very worthwhile to me to have been honored to be here. And then again, congrats to the Parks Foundation. I understand I'll be volunteering for that. I'll talk to uh, <laughs> chairperson to my right. Uh, no problem, I love that stuff. 
But, um, and they're moving forward with the hollow weekend also, just as important as the holiday lighting celebration too. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, if I need to be a, an elf, I'll, I can do that. So that's fun stuff. And lastly, for me, uh, volunteers, uh, those that are here tonight talking about the pump track, they're volunteers with their kids and being part of the, the city of Corona. And the city is based and built upon volunteers. And the last weekend I had a chance to be in an adult training session for scout leaders. And their kids are really six years old to about nine or 10. But they're volunteers. They gave their whole weekend to be uh, uh, trained about how to be a better leader, a better mentor, a better part of the uh, movement and growth of their children. And the, those that aren't their children too. So that was pretty nice. So again, um, I think with that being said, we're just full of Esperanza, full of hope in our community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I said most of my comments during the director's report, but um, I just want to congratulate Vice Chair Munoz for joining the Corona Parks Foundation Board. We are happy to have you. And I'm looking forward to you, you know, having you at helping out with the events. So we've got the um, holiday lighting coming up and the Halloween weekend, so that's exciting. Um, and again, I want to thank the uh, members of the public for coming out and bringing our awareness to the pump track uh, issue that you guys are supportive and that you're, you're looking for that new amenity in our park system. So, so thank you for coming and, and speaking. I really appreciate that. Um, and with that, do we have any additional announcements that we need to make, Dr. Turner? Are we, we're good? Okay, with that, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you so much.